All right, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 3. Finally got the study done, the expository study on Revelation chapter 3. Um, been working on it for a while. We've had some trials come up here, and, and I'll discuss those uh, in a little bit. But uh, some just some things really going on. And uh, <clears throat> But, you know, as I was reading through this, this chapter, like I said, when I do an expository study, I'll go through each chapter many, many, many times and just read through it. Sometimes I'll listen to it, you know, Alexander Scorby recordings. But I'll just go through it and go through it and go through it and go through it. And sometimes I hit verses and I'm just like, there's something the Lord wants me to see here and I just cannot get it. My mind is not focused. I'm just, I got other things in my mind or whatever else and, and I just pray about it. That's why it was late. Um, there's just a couple things that the Lord just kind of, there was blockades there, so to speak, and uh, getting through those, praying, waiting, the Lord shows you some really good stuff. And the Lord showed me some very interesting things in chapter 3, uh, some things I've not heard before. So um, it's going to be a good study. It's going to be a lot of fun. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Let's begin. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars... I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. All right. First part of it. What are the seven spirits of God? Well, we talked about this. I think it was in chapter one, the chapter one study. So we're not going to go there, but I'll give you the scripture reference. Isaiah chapter 11, verse two lists the seven spirits of God. Very interesting. God definitely has a system of numbers in the Bible. And Satan perverts it and twists it into numerology. In the occult, they do things by the numbers and things like this. But understand, um, I heard a statement the one time, and it's uh, very much true, and that is that every evil thing is a good thing twisted. A very true, very true statement. God's system of numbers is a holy thing. Satan twists it and turns it into numerology. All right, But uh, you'll see the number seven connected with God, and the number seven is all throughout the book of Revelation. We'll see that as we continue through this study over the next couple of weeks or months or however long it takes us to get through it. Uh, this is something I'm not going to rush. All right, um, I'm going to, I have other studies I'm going to be interjecting here and stuff and I might take a couple weeks off from the Revelation thing because going through Revelation, um, as I've said in my first study, the introduction to the whole thing, Revelation is not written to Christians. All right, um, Revelation is for another dispensation, the people in the time of Jacob's trouble. And again, I've, if you know anything about the ministry, I've talked a lot about that uh, extensively on that issue. So for me to go through and doctrinally say exactly what's going to be happening, happening, no. What the purpose of these studies is not an expository study to explain every little thing in the book of Revelation. No, it's, it's for instruction and righteousness for a Christian living today in the church age. Again, if you don't understand dispensational teaching, I have a secondary channel. Um, you can go there. I have a thing on the seven dispensations. Uh, it's, you know, very, very, very important, major Bible doctrine. If you're non-dispensational, you will never understand the Bible. But look what it says there in the second part of the verse. Uh, it says about, I know thy works. They're all judged according to their works. That thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Hmm. So Sardis has a name that thou livest, but yet they're dead. What does that mean? Well, let's turn back to Proverbs chapter 21. This might end up being a pretty long study today. I'm not sure. There's a lot of scriptures to go over. But if you're saved and if you like uh, a lot of uh, scripture, a lot of deep doctrine and things, well, then this is your study. If you're looking for a five-minute sermon, uh, go someplace else. Proverbs chapter 21, verse um, 16. says here, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Yeah. You know how you wander out of the way of understanding? You go to a building called a church. You say, oh, here he goes again. You know, you really need to pay attention to what the scriptures say. And when the scriptures 
give no grounds at all for building a building, calling it a church, and inviting saved and lost to it. Uh, there's probably a reason for that. It's not an oversight on God's part. Well, that came later and God just didn't see it coming or something. But they fixed that up later on. That's not the case. There's a reason God did not have any scriptures in the New Testament telling you to build a building and call it a church. The church is the people. And I proved that over and over and over again. Okay? But here's the thing. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding. Who's the one that gives you understanding? The Lord. You're supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He is the one that's supposed to teach you. We're going to see that as we continue. What happens? You remain in the congregation of the dead. Oh, nuts. I, I forgot. Oh, boy. I'm going to have to get back to this study because I just remembered i got to get down to the church. It's my day to clean. Oh, man, I can't believe I signed up for that. And this weekend coming up, we got a fellowship meal. And... Um, and then we're going to, well, oh yeah, there's visitation uh, Saturday morning. I forgot about that. We've got to go out and knock on doors and invite people to church. And, and uh, I forgot, I'm supposed to be teaching Sunday school this week, too. Oh, boy, I, I just, I, oh, well, that's right. I've got to remind my wife, too. She's got the ladies' social coming up here. And, and uh, my son's going to be in, in uh, Sunday school. And we got to, oh, he had a project he was supposed to get done. And, and then we got to arrange that trip, uh, that evangelistic trip going down to south of here. And, and uh, we, Have you been through that? I have. And I don't have an attitude because I was scarred in my past or something. I get that thing too. It's ridiculous. No, what happens is you start to say, hey, you get saved and you say, you know what, I want to read this book and I want to go and, and everything else. And you go, to, you go to your church building someplace and, you, and you're all excited about learning something and you sit down and the first half hour is announcements. Um, hey, we got a, we got a, the, the sheet there. Sign, you know, send the, send the clipboard around with the thing. If you can come and help out cleaning the church, or if you can volunteer for things, just sign up. Uh, the, okay, let's send, that, send around the other one. And, and uh, hey, uh, news here recently, a uh, brother so-and-so went to the hospital. Could we have some people go and, and bake some, or sister so-and-so went to the hospital. Uh, she's going to give birth to their third child. Could we have some people volunteer to cook meals for the... And what happens? Well, there were visitors in church today, so the pastor, instead of teaching us the Word of God, he had to preach a salvation message. So the Christian goes to church wanting to learn from the Bible, and they go in there and they, go, they come out going, I didn't even learn anything. What happened? You've been derailed from your personal walk with the Lord. You will have wandered out of the way of understanding. So you would say that you have a name, that you are alive, you're saved, you're born again, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, but spiritually, you're just about dead. I went through it. I went through it. Years and years and years and years and years. I was learning so much stuff on my own, on my own studies and things, reading, listening to sermons, and, and just just devouring the scriptures and I'd go to church and it was just like, there's no time for that. I have a question, preacher. Yeah, well, you know, it's quarter till noon. I mean, we'll get into that sometime in the future. Yeah. You can go, if you go to a Babel building someplace, you will have a name. You might be saved, but spiritually you're going to be basically dead. Why? Why? It's a social club. You're there to fellowship and to, and to encourage other people and to do all this other stuff. Well, I got questions. Well, some other time. We got work to do. We got to keep the building going, you know. We got a mortgage we got to pay off. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to a, a Babel building, Liberty Baptist Church in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. They had a mortgage of... Uh, I forget what it was now. It was like $250,000 or something. You know, quarter million dollars that they owed on the place. And we'd say, you know, why don't you sell it, you know, and get a smaller building someplace or whatever else. There's not that many people going here anymore because they had so many church splits. <laughs> it's formerly a Jack Hiles church, a spinoff of the Jack, Jack Hiles cult. But they'd had so many church splits, you know, there's only like 30 people going there and it could seat a couple hundred. It was ridiculous. Could barely afford to heat the place in the wintertime, but, you know, the parking lot looked like it had been through a war. 
uh, fire alarm system didn't even work in the place, whatever. But, uh, you know, oh, we can't sell the place. We can't sell the place. Finally found out they couldn't sell it because it's 501c3. You can't sell 501c3 buildings. You have to trade them off to another 501c3 corporation. <laughs> it's insane. Next, let's go to 1 John. See, they had a name that, that they were alive. I know that there were some people there that I would definitely say were saved. Some of the people I knew and things like that. I believe that they were saved. Sure. But uh, what was their walk like with the Lord? Didn't have time for it. Got to get to church. Got choir tonight. And all you do is you just keep that building going. Just keep that thing functioning. I had a brother say when he was leaving Liberty Bathic, uh, Brother Jesse Dolesky, I remember we were in ministry together for a while, and, and he said, he said when he left, he said it was just like, he felt like he was just unhooking the chain from this dead corpse, you know, this big old building that, you know, was from the glory days and stuff. It's just like, ah, getting out of thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. They had a name that they were alive, but they were actually dead. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27 through 29 says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. Yeah. So what do we have there? Again, ye need not that any man teach you. Now, I'm not saying just be totally rogue Christian out, running around, you know, whatever else. No, you're, it's good to learn from people. It's good to learn from men. If you're a woman, you can learn from men and women, you know, and things. There are great sisters out there that can teach you the truth. Uh, certainly. Absolutely. And the most important thing is for you to develop that personal relationship between you and the Lord. You don't have any need to have somebody above you. There's one mediator between God and men, the man, excuse me, the man Christ Jesus. But when you wander away from that, you might have a name that you're alive, you might be saved, but spiritually you're going to be just about dead when you get away from that relationship. When you stop studying, when you stop the forward movement, when you stop your growth as a Christian. That's what's being warned about there in Revelation chapter 3. Let's go back there. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 2. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. There will be parts of you as a Christian, even the most backslidden Christian, will still have some good traits to them. You get somebody that's just totally wicked and whatever else, I would say that they're a false convert. You know, um, people that say, oh, I'm an atheist. I was raised Christian. I'm an atheist now. No, you were never saved. I don't believe that. But you get a Christian that's messed around, that's been a truly carnal Christian, uh, that's messed around, they'll still have some, some good aspects to them. Um, they won't be totally heathen. There will still be some good things. I've met Christians that are really, really messed up with the flesh and just poor health and everything else, but they still believe the King James Bible. They'd still listen to the right kind of music and whatever else, but they've got a whole lot of other problems. You know, uh, you should uh, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. But uh, let's look at a couple things here. The Bible says there, be watchful. What's this thing about watching? Acts chapter 20 Turn back to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 29. Start there, down through verse 31. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. There's a lot of very false Bible believers out there, professing Bible believers. Be careful about that. Therefore, watch. And remember that by the space of three years, I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. That's part of a ministry. 
New Testament ministry is warning about false prophets. That's what I do. All right? I'm not obsessed with false prophets in the sense of I just watch everything that they do. No, I just warn about them. All right? That's important to do. Why? Because if you get led away by a false prophet, they can actually kill you spiritually. Now, now they won't take away your soul. That's not what I'm saying. You will have a name that you're alive, but a lot of areas of your spiritual life are going to be dead. All right? False prophets can do it. Going to a Babel building and getting out of fellowship with the Lord can do it. Put down the book and it will definitely do it. You've got to be careful about that stuff. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Turn over there. 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians chapter 16, beginning in verse 13. Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. Uh, very, very good advice. Watch. You're supposed to be aware of some of what's going on. Now, that doesn't mean to the extent where you're just looking at prophetic update stuff all the time and not doing anything else with your life. Um, you're to watch, but in moderation. Stand fast in the faith. I've talked about this thing, the, how to be a good stubborn Christian, and that was said in jest. I know stubbornness is a sin and whatever. I'm being sarcastic. Okay, people. Some people don't catch on to my sarcasm sometimes. When you stand fast, it means you are standing like this. You're not moving. Somebody says, excuse me, could you move to the side? Sorry, I have to stand right here. Well, couldn't you just move just to, no. See? Um, hey, look, I, I understand that you use the King James Bible, and I respect that. I really do. But here at this Bible study, we don't really want you reading from that. No. Sorry. I'm going to read from it. Well, the, I, we did, okay, then I'm going to leave. See what I'm saying? Stand fast. Well, you know, I, to me, the, the rapture, timing of the rapture is really not that important of a doctrine. I mean, can't we just agree to disagree? No. Sorry, I'm standing fast. Jesus Christ is coming to take his bride away before the time of Jacob's trouble begins, before the Antichrist is even unleashed. Sorry, not moving. Hey, there are some non-dispensational Christians here. Do you think you could just kind of take it easy? No. I believe in the command to rightly divide the word of truth according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. No. You know, well, are you sure people are going to go to hell? Yes. What are you doing? Standing fast. That's what you're doing. That's what we're supposed to do. Quit you like men. Be tough. Be strong, in other words, there. Verse 13. Let your things be done with charity. You can be strong. You can, be, you can stand fast and still have charity with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Turn over there. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Show you another thing here about watching. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Very true for today, as I've been over this, these scriptures many times. But look at verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Yeah, watch. What did the Lord say to Sardis there? Go back there. Revelation chapter 3. What did the Lord say to Sardis? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Be watchful. Right now, there's whole huge hordes of people. The Vatican has taken over every group out there except for one group, and that is the King James Bible believers. All the others are going right back to the Vatican again. 
They already got you if you're in a church building someplace because you're doing things that they do. So they come out and they say, join us. And you go, I will not join the Roman Catholic Church. They say, hypocrite, you're doing the same practices that we do. You're doing all kinds of things that don't appear in the scriptures, just like Catholics do. What do you mean you're not going to join with Catholicism? And isn't it interesting too, by the way, I just want to add this little, nice little jab there to some of the brethren out there that are having some issues with the whole election thing. I find it very interesting that almost every teacher out there that's telling Christians to vote for the lesser of two evils, they're tied to the Babel buildings. And the Babel buildings are tied to the federal government. How about that? It's almost like people that have the government in between them and the Lord because the government can tell them what to do in their buildings. It's almost like those people are worried about who gets elected. I'm not worried about who gets elected. You know what? You ready? I hope Hillary Clinton gets elected. <gasps> oh, no. Yeah, you know why? Because then Christians will be awake. But if Donald Trump gets in, then they'll go, Praise the Lord! Our man got in! Everything's going to get better! He's going to bring back America! He's going to make America great again! It's a blessing a lot of times to have a bad leader. And you know, wouldn't it be something if the Lord lets some liberal lunatic in? And of course, you know, like Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump are even going to be able to control anything in the country. The president, the, the office of president here in America, it's a, it's a, it's a show. It's a joke. You know, I mean, give me a break. It's kind of funny too, is my wife and I were talking about this. The last actor, and Donald Trump's an actor, by the way, too. Well, he had his own television show, The Apprentice. He's an actor. The last time there was a professional actor in as president was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the first president to bring the Pope to the shores of America. And yet so many of the Bible building brethren, the Baptist brethren, oh, Ronald Reagan, oh, Reaganomics, and oh, oh Re Ronald Reagan. He was a traitor, a total, complete traitor. Brought the Pope to America. The first president in United States history to bring the Pope to the shores of America. And Donald Trump comes out and says, we need to end anti-Catholic bias. And we need to be more concerned about, you know, developing a world community. Our place in the world community and stuff like this. And the Baptists go, yay, <laughs> it's our hero, our man, I'm going to vote. What do you expect me to do, stay home? Yes. Send a message to the Vatican and say, we are aware of your deception. I'm not voting for either one of your little stooges. But, oh, you got to preserve your Babel building. What would happen if Hillary Clinton took, gets elected and the liberals take over and, and they force their sodomite agenda upon the churches? They already are. And, and you know, and, 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 and they take away our church buildings from us. Gee, you might have to go back to the New Testament way of doing things then. Oh, not like that. Oh, papists. Bunch of stinking papists. Whatever. How do you strengthen the things that remain? If you're still with me. How do you strengthen the things that remain? Like it says there in verse 2. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. All right. How do you do that? Well, let me give you a couple. Number one. America is gone. Oh, well, I think we could bring it back. People. It's not coming back. America is gone. We're not going to elect a leader to get them in and, oh, and things are going to be brought back and whatever else, you know, that's not going to happen, right? America's gone. But is there something that remains? Do you have a King James Bible? Yes. Can you still buy King James Bibles? Yes. Okay, then let's strengthen that. Instead of spending your energy fighting for America, I mean, there's no way to bring it back, people. I mean, the $20 trillion in debt, how are you going to pay off $20 trillion? Give me a break. Not going to happen. You know, we're about ready to go into World War III, you know, and, and people are waving their little American flag. It's made in China. It's like <laughs> cuckooville. But, you know, what do we strengthen? Strengthen the things that remain. We still have freedom here to be able to preach the Word of God. We're going to see this in a little bit. The doors are still open. All right. Protestantism is 
gone. You know, there's one point in time I would have stood with a lot of the Protestant movement. You know, you go back far enough, a lot of the Protestants were very much anti-Catholic. Now, quote-unquote, Protestant churches are in bed with the Vatican again. All right? A lot of the Protestant leaders that, you know, guys that founded different movements within Protestantism, Martin Luther and stuff, they were just making a different form of Catholicism. I'm not saying that that was good Protestantism. What I'm saying is that there were Christians that were in the Protestant system that were definitely saved. Certainly. I would have joined with them. I'm not going to join with the modern-day Protestants. But Bible-believing Christianity is not gone. It's something that remains, and we can strengthen it. And how do you strengthen it? By purging it. By judging it. People, you know, when are you going to come out with videos exposing James White? Well, if I ever get time, but I'm too busy right now trying to keep the Bible-believing movement going. I'm too busy right now trying to sort out, and see, is that guy a wolf? Is that guy, can you trust this guy? Can you... I have to do that. Let's keep the Bible-believing movement strong. I mean, anybody that takes James White seriously, is there's some major problems there. I mean, you get, might, maybe somebody that's brand new saved, they're really green, they don't really understand. Okay. But most of these people that are just defenders, militant defenders of James White, they are lost. As lost as James White is. Sad. Real money is gone. Okay. Oh, I, I, no, that's not true, brother, because I got a good bank account. I've saved up for my retirement and everything else. Social Security is going to be good when it kicks in and everything else. It's gone. It's an illusion right now. Delusion, actually, more like it. You know, it's gone. But the ability to lay up treasures in heaven is not. Can you still witness to the lost in this country? Yes. Over in Russia, they took that away. They said no public evangelism. But you can still do it in America. You can still buy all the tracts you want, all the gospel tracts that you want. But you'd rather keep your money in the bank and sit on it, you know, because a rainy day might come. The rainy day's here. <laughs> okay? Uh, you better do something with that money instead of hoarding it. How about the environment? The environment's gone. And again, you know, I realize that there are atheists that watch some of these videos and stuff. Um, do you think that you have a real good, firm home here on this planet? You know, a lot, a lot of these atheists, it's so funny, you know, they're just like, oh, you know, we're moving into times when people are going to give up religious superstition. <laughs> are you kidding? You know? I mean, are you that blind to think that people are going to give up religious superstition? Can you not see that the Pope and the Vatican is taking over? Can you not see forcible conversion coming up? Weird. But, you know, the whole thing is pollution and all the toxicity and everything else, we're not going to get the earth back. It's not going to happen. All right? It's just not there. But what remains? Good natural health is not totally gone yet. We were talking about this this morning, you know, and, and we, we've been getting into this thing of smoothies. You know, they, they, you take a bunch of stuff, and vegetables and fruits and stuff, and you stick it in a blender, and you, brrr, you, you know, grind it up into liquid, and you drink that stuff. And there's all kinds of superfoods that you can get, like uh, turmeric is a, is a real good one. It's like a very powerful antidepressant. You put a little bit of black pepper with it. Very, very good. Um, camu Camu powder. It's from South America. It's like the highest vitamin C content. Uh, cacao, which is where chocolate comes from, but it's chocolate is, is just a little bit of cacao and a whole lot of sugar. Um, mostly not very good for you. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of that stuff, and you can combine it with fruits and vegetables and stuff, and you will feel really good. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not into that stuff. I said that for years, you know, but... The whole thing is, brethren, we are being bombarded with toxicity. Electronic smog, all the cell phones, television, radio waves, everything. It's just terrible. Um, pollution from vehicles just everywhere. It's pollution going into the atmosphere, um, geoengineering, uh, all the different stuff. I mean, it's just we live in a very, very toxic world. So you have to spend a little bit more time being concerned about your health. All right. You have to do a little bit more. 
to strengthen the things which remain. And a lot of the brethren, you know, kind of get this pride thing of coming up and just like, oh, I just eat, you know, fast food when I want, and I drink soda pop. Yeah, okay. And talk to me in a few years when you have diabetes or cancer. We'll see how tough you are then. Tough guy. Oh, the Lord's going to protect me. You're not going to find that in the Bible. You know, and I've seen these guys, I'll say, well, the Bible says, you know, about the, every creature of God is good, nothing be refused with, you know, if it be received with thanksgiving, you know. Uh, yeah, it says every creature. It doesn't say every type of food. You can eat any kind of an animal and ask for God's blessing to be upon it. You can't eat every kind of food out there. And, you know, you go to the grocery store, you know, 90, probably 98% of the stuff in a grocery store I won't even eat, you know. And it's, it's tough sometimes. I mean, it's very difficult. You're walking through and I'm like, man, I used to love those when I was little. And you look at it and it's corn syrup, MSG, you know, all this other garbage in it. And you're just... Man, you know, oh, nuts. And then they change, you know, MSG to natural flavors, you know. And it's like, ah, you know. But what am I saying? When you're having problems, and if you don't think, by the way, let me say this, don't get too obsessed with the physical. But if you think that the physical doesn't affect the spiritual, if you're in bad shape physically, it will, it will affect your spiritual abilities, uh, you need to take that stuff into consideration is what I'm saying. And so when you're having a problem, when you there's you know kind of a, a wall there, a block there between you and the Lord, you have to look at your life and you have to say, okay, there are certain things that I can't do anything about. Uh, we can't turn this country around. We can't go back to old time, powerful, you know, revival type of stuff going on like it Back in the 1800s, that's not going to come back. Um, after the rapture, it will. Because then people are going to know who was really saved and who was lost. And you're going to see a great multitude there, Revelation chapter 7, uh, that gets saved out of that time. But we need to strengthen the things that remain, is what I'm trying to say. And you could just keep going on and on and on with the list there, making things, you know. But it's, it's very, very important to strengthen those things that remain. I could do a whole study on that. Verse 3, Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Hmm, very, very interesting there. But let's just look at the beginning here. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Very interesting. Let's look up a couple verses here that deal with this very subject. How about received? James chapter 1. Turn back to the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. This book. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Okay? So, receive. What are you supposed to receive as a Christian? Do you realize the gift that God's given you, Christian? The book, the greatest book ever written? There's no mystery. You see some angel of light and you come down and it comes down and it says, I am here to bring world peace. You go, okay, let me see. Is there a, some kind of an angel of light that comes and says that it's bringing world peace? Oh, whoa. Hey, you're the Antichrist. Christians aren't going to be there. I'm just trying to make a point here. Some guy comes along and he says, um, God told me that I'm supposed to have lots of gold and riches and things like that and I want you to give it to me. 
Well, the Bible says over in 1 Timothy chapter 6, love of, verse 10, that for the love of money is the root of all evil. How's that work? Have you received the book? Well, it's, a, it's just a translation. All translations have errors, and we can't really rely on any translation. Okay, uh, our text says here, which is able to save your souls. You mean to tell me somebody can be saved and yet reject the engrafted word? God's written word? 1 John chapter 5, verse 13 talks about, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. But you can reject the book and still be saved. You're a Christian that rejects the Bible. I don't think so. I really don't think so. And by the way, you say, well, you're in the book of James. Yeah, the book of James has some things that doctrin doctrinally overlap other dispensations. I believe and teach that the, that the book of James is written specifically to somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. Sure. But this verse here, these verses that we read in chapter 1 there, they apply to anybody in any dispensation. But how about the thing of heard? We've received. What have we heard? Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Again, that's why I always try to lift this book up and give this book to my viewers and say, here's the standard. You can get a King James Bible and you can read it for yourself. Right there you go. You have no need that any man teach you. Have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Get the book and read it for yourself. The most hardcore atheist out there, it's not going to bite you, okay? Go get a King James Bible and read it for yourself. I mean, you talk about, all oh, Christians are hypocrites and stuff like this. Read in there and see if you're judging correctly. Because this book, you know, judges hypocrites. Judges you too as an atheist, but, you know, find out why. See? Greatest book that's ever been written. How about hold fast? First Thessalonians, go over there. First Thessalonians chapter five. Beginning in verse sixteen. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hold fast, like we talked about earlier. Don't compromise, don't give in. To the modern trends of the world. They tell you, oh, you have to change. Oh, your, your beliefs are so outdated. I mean, come on. Nobody believes the way that you believe anymore. I don't care. I'm holding fast. Sorry, not going to bend. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. We'll see it here again. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold fast. Don't move. Don't back down for anyone for any reason. You say, well, brother, you know, I was over at my grandparents' house and my grandmother, she got a little bit upset when I was trying to witness to her. and She, she said that if I'm going to come over again, she doesn't want me to bring the Bible. And What am I supposed to do? Bring the Bible. Well, she said I shouldn't come back then. Then don't go back. Hold fast. Don't back down for anyone. It's so terrible, isn't it? Uh, well, it'd be a lot worse to stand before the Lord and have to give an account of why you changed, why you uh, turned back against the Lord. Acts chapter 26. What about repent? 
about this thing of repentance. We're told in our text there, Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, that you're to repent. Acts chapter 26, verse 15. We'll start there. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Paul here is recounting his story of, you know, on the road to Damascus when he met the Lord. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in, which, in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the he heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, ready, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. You see it? There are works that are meet for repentance, works that prove you've repented, you've changed your life after salvation. Don't tell me that this is all just going from unbelief to belief. <laughs> uh-uh. No. There are works involved after you get saved. Not to keep yourself saved. Not to earn your salvation. No, you come in faith to the cross and you put your faith in Jesus Christ's finished work on the cross. But then what happens is now you're going to be living differently. You're not going to live perfectly sinless. Okay, that's heresy. But you will do works meet for repentance. There will be a changed life. And all these Satanists out there that are saying that's a heretical doctrine, it's because they themselves are lost. They themselves have their own little secret sins that they don't want to give up. So they say, I can believe in Jesus Christ and kind of, you know, fornicate here on the side. But I believe in Jesus. It's okay. Like Jack Hiles did. One of the big uh, perpetrators of this movement of this easy believism, false gospel. He's shacking up with his deacon's wife, Jenny Nishik. Facts, I'm not telling you a lie here. Even Jack Howes' own daughter came out and said, yeah, my dad was you know, committing adultery. Yeah, she knew it. So did a lot of other people. But you don't dare speak against the man of God. And he's, he's a great soul winner and he's led thousands. You know what Jack Howes did and his little minions? Stephen Anderson is one of them. He went to Howes Anderson College. Uh, was, I think he left like a month or two before he was going to graduate. But he's a Hiles Anderson cultist and his little group that he's sending out now. You know what these guys are doing? They go on soul winning crusades. They're actually going on soul damning crusades. Because they go, they knock on the door. Person comes to the door, they say, pardon me, would you like to come to church? Well, or do you go to church any place or whatever else? Uh, would you like to be saved? Would you like to know how to be saved? And people are very polite and a lot of times they'll go, uh, they feel uncomfortable. This guy's there on their front porch and they're going, oh great, what do I do to get rid of this guy? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, what do I do to be, be saved? Well, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Well, I guess so. Well, would you be willing to pray this prayer? Well, sure, I, I guess I could, you know. Uh, and they pray the prayer, and the guy goes, okay, congratulations. According to the Word of God, it says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall I be saved. You believe, you're saved. Congratulations. Here's our invitation to come to church. We'd like to see you. Thank you. Goodbye. And they go off, and that dirty, rotten, stinking liar just goes, well, we got another soul saved. And that's why they'll come back and they go, we got 300 saved today. Wow, what a tremendous day. How many of them came to your church? Well, none of them, but, uh, you know, they're all saved. They're all saved. They believed. You know, they're believed. So they're, they're saved. They're saved. Where the works meet for repentance. That's a false gospel. Huh? <laughs> but see, those people, if they don't have enough brains, what they're going to do is they're going to say, well, I guess I'm... A Christian now I did this prayer thing they showed me from the Bible that that's I just have to believe that Jesus died and I guess I that's good and you know I used to go door to door and we would run into these people that were put through that Jack Hiles brainwashing and they you'd say to them are you saved I think so do you know for sure no well what makes you think you're saved well I was told that I was saved it's like, what? <laughs> you know, the one guy, I remember, I'll never forget, he had just gone through a heart surgery and he was like, well, I am actually worried about where I'm going to go when I die. 
And we said, are you saved? And he's like, well, that's what they tell me. And we were like, huh? And he goes, well, my wife's church, my pastor, her pastor said that I'm saved. He took me down front and I prayed this prayer and things. And, and he said, I'm a Christian. And we said, but do you know? And he said, no, I have no idea. And we said, do you know if, if you died tonight, would you really have that assurance that you're going to be in heaven when you die? He said, honestly, no, I don't think I would be. What happened? Well, he was led uh, in a prayer by soul dammers. Not soul winners, soul dammers. It's disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. But let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to see this thing about, you know, if you don't repent and things, you're, you know, the Lord's going to come on you as a thief when you're not looking for Him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And that's going to be the truly tragic thing. I think that there are going to be people that are going to die and they're going to die in their sins and they're going to get to heaven and they're going to go, but I'm a Christian. I prayed the prayer. And the Lord's going to say, depart from me, ye cursed. I never knew you. Sorry. And, you know, they could, have, they could have come to the Lord. They could have, you know, truly gotten saved and everything else. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that they're going to be like, well, I'm innocent. You know, the Lord's going to say, yeah, I know. It's a shame. You know, no. Anybody can get saved, certainly. But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Okay, you're going to see here the command to watch in Revelation chapter 3, verse 3. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Hmm. Interesting. Because I've talked about this in other studies. There's two ways to look at this thing. When they say, Peace and safety, does that mean we have peace and safety? Or they're saying, We want peace and safety. It's war right now, and we're looking for peace and safety. I have no idea. Um, I find it very interesting that we are about that close to heading into World War III. Uh, Putin recently said, not very long ago, a couple like a week or so ago, he said World War III is now unavoidable. The West is pushing us into it. World War III is unavoidable. President of Russia. And they're building up their military, and it's we're heading into World War III. It's not going to be that long. And people are saying, peace and safety. What if during World War III the rapture happens and most people don't even take notice? Just assume it's just another part of the war. I don't know. I'm watching. Are you watching? Are you uh, cleaning up your life? Verse 4. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Watch, you know. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, get that one, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Amen. We can be comforted. It's a great joy to see that, uh, you say, World War III is coming. Isn't that a bad thing? Well, if you're lost, yeah, sure. You say, what if you get killed in the war? Absent from the body, present with the Lord? Whatever. But if you're not saved, yeah, you better start worrying. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4. Let's continue. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. It's interesting because at any time in church history, the popular trends of the day, you're always going to have Christians that don't conform to it. They're going to look at the popular things that people are doing and well, everybody's going here and everybody's doing this and everybody's doing that and they just go, you know what? No. There's a lot of uh, Sardis-type Christians out there. P 
people that are dead. They have a name. They're saved. But spiritually, they're not really doing a whole lot. They're dead. You say, well, then I guess they're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I guess I just have to be like them. No. No. You don't have to do what everybody else is doing. You say, well, then I might, uh, I might be ostracized and kind of be by myself. Good. You know, as a Christian, you can never be by yourself. You always have Jesus Christ with you. And isn't it sad that so many times we say, well, I guess all I have left is Jesus Christ, and all I can do now is just pray. Almost like that's the last resort. You know, I know it's an it's a expression and things. I've talked about that in the past, but Jesus is everything. Or at least he should be. Verse 5. <coughs> He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Hmm. Now this is one of those verses that uh, I get myself tr in trouble in because I take it literally. I believe that there are people that can be blotted out whose names can be blotted out of the book of life. I believe what the text says. You say, well, don't you believe in eternal security? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, then how could you believe in eternal security and yet believe people can be blotted out of the na their name blotted out of the book of life? Well, because I believe what the Bible says. I go through the Pauline epistles and I'm looking and I'm going, okay, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You know, if we're, if we're you know, chastened of the Lord, we're not condemned with the world. And, you know, I, I see scripture after scripture after scripture. I'm sealed. I'm, I'm saved, certainly. But then I see other scriptures and I go, okay, that one and those ones in Hebrews are obviously written to Hebrews, I know that's very difficult for some people, but, uh, you know, they're into Hebrews. What's well, Hebrews? Well, right now there's neither Jew or Gentile, so when do the Hebrews, why would Paul write to the Hebrews? And I do, do believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Time of Jacob's trouble. Because in that time period, you can definitely lose your salvation. Certainly. There's no question about that. So, there are passages of Scripture where people are losing salvation. This, I believe, is another one of those. Now, there are two ways that people can, you know, interpret this. The first way is, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Okay? So people say, well, in the very beginning, everybody's name is written in the book of life. You know, and there's some interesting stuff on that. You know, I don't get into a whole lot of this, but they say, if you take like the third letter of every fourth word out of every fifth verse or something like this it'll it can spell somebody's name out and there's all this theoretical stuff going on um i forget what the thing's called equidistant letter sequencing or something like this and people have done research into this and they find people's names in the bible and things like this and and uh you know the theory is if you are changing the word of god you might actually be taking your own name out of the book of life it's interesting but Am I going to say that that's really scientific? Eh, I'm not real convinced of it, honestly. But the, the one teaching would be that when your name is blotted out of the book of life, that means everybody's names were originally in the book of life, and then later they get blotted out of the book of life. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, you know, the other way of looking at the verse, which is the way I look at it, is that there are people in this future time period that their name is written into the book of life and they fall away, they take the mark, and God goes and erases their name out. You see that in Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. People adding to or taking away from the word of God, God takes away their part out of the book of life. Again, Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So I take that stuff literally. That doesn't shake my faith in eternal security because, you know, the same way it doesn't, you know, uh, problems in marriage does not shake my faith in marriage. You say, what are you talking about? Well, I believe in the sanctity of marriage, but I believe that there are scriptural grounds for divorce in what Jesus Christ said, fornication being grounds for divorce, also known as what would be adultery in the confines of a marriage. There, But Jesus Christ said fornication, so I use fornication as a word. And you say, well, then you don't really believe in the sanctity of marriage. Yes, I do. 
but there's a cause there. There's one exception to the rule that a husband and wife are supposed to stay together, and that is if one of them commits fornication. Well, in much the same way, I believe in eternal security. But if you take away from the Word of God, and I believe the other one is in Revelation, or Romans chapter 11, where you're speaking very much hateful of the nation of Israel, um, you know, and you can argue that one too. Again, we're not going to get into all that stuff, but I believe in eternal security with those as possible exceptions. Again, I look at them and I go, okay, literally it's saying people are cut off, their names are being taken out of the book of life. I'm going to stay away from that stuff because ironically, both of them are calling God a liar. God promises to Abraham and his seed certain land. And people come along and they say, no, they're not going to get the land anymore. We believe in replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. Then God's a liar. Because the Jews never got that land. What was promised to Abraham? They've never had it. They don't have it today. They will only have it in the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> so, but that's a whole other, you know, major, major thing there. But what's going on there in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5? Doctrinally for today, again, I'm not going to teach it as, you know, you have to overcome and things like this or else your name's going to be take or blotted out of the book of life. I believe doctrinally there's some definite stuff for the a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble. There. But uh, you say, I don't agree. That's your freedom. You can do that. All right, verse 6 in Revelation chapter 3. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay. Um, very interesting. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What did we read earlier? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I believe that this book is meant to be read with your eyes and heard with your ears. That's why you're watching this study right now. You're reading along, at least you better be, in your print King James Bible, not some kind of a little goofy ebook thing or whatever. You've got to move the thing. In. I don't mess with that electronic junk. You know, I don't believe the Lord intended that stuff. Whatever. Read along in your print King James Bible, and as you're reading it with your eyes, you're also hearing it. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. You see? And uh, again, you know, another thing that I think is wonderful is if you can get recordings of the Alexander Scorby recordings of reading the King James Bible, and you can be out taking a walk in nature, you can be out doing yard work, you can be doing the dishes, you can be cooking a meal, doing laundry, whatever, and you can be hearing the Word of God. And I think it's, it's great to do both. It's great to read the Word of God. It's great to hear the Word of God. So it's an interesting thing. Now it gets very interesting. Verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Now, I read that thing and I thought, yeah, okay, it's a pretty easy. You can just look at that thing, you know, whatever there. But then the Lord really started to kind of convict me and say, you know, look a little bit deeper at this thing. Here's where it gets very interesting. I want you to notice the Godhead in verse 7. The Trinity, if you want to call it that. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. There's three. And you say, well, what about the fourth? He that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, no man openeth. That goes along with the key of David. Well, I'm going to show you that. Very interesting little study here coming up. And we're not going to turn to these scriptures. But uh, he that is holy, who's that? God the Father. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Verse 16 talks about, be ye holy for I am holy. And in context, in the in the in the passage there is talking about God being our Father. We're His children. So, God the Father is holy. He that is holy. How about He that is true? Well, the Holy Spirit of truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. When the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. Hmm. So you see the second part of the Godhead there. How about the He that hath the key of David? Well, that would be Jesus Christ 
who is going to physically reign on the earth in the millennial kingdom. Say, prove it. Psalm chapter, well, not chapter 2. Psalm 2, uh, verse 1 through 12. How many verses? 12. How many tribes? 12. Hmm. Interesting. Jesus Christ has the key of David. David was the king of the Jews. Jesus is the king of the Jews. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. It says in the Gospels. Interesting. Jesus ruling over the twelve tribes. Twelve verses in Psalm 2. It's all just coincidental, you know. You know don't worry about it. But how about the thing of... Uh, Openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Here's a good one. Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah 22. This is one of these oh boy moments. <laughs> I was reading this and I was like, Wow, that's really incredible. Isaiah 22, verse 20 through 25. And shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of David. Or excuse me, the house of Judah. Excuse me, excuse me. I was reading the next verse. Um, did that happen? Mm -mm. Eliakim did not fulfill that prophecy there. He did not become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Well, who's it speaking about? What did we read back there in Revelation? The key of David? Look at verse 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. It's not talking about Eliakim. Eliakim is simply a type of the Jewish Messiah. Who's the Jewish Messiah? The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has fulfilled that scripture. He opens and no man shuts, and he shuts and no man opens. We're going to look at that. I'm going to show you the proof. The Christian church has seen the proof of that for all of church history, the last almost 2,000 years. I've seen it in my own life. How the Lord will open and shut doors. I've seen it. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. But let's continue reading. This is a very interesting part here. Isaiah chapter 22, let's look at verse 23. And I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. Hmm. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. Fasten him as a nail. His feet. How many nails did, uh, were used on Jesus? Three. Fastened in a sure place. Verse 24, And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups, even to all the vessels of flagons. Vessels. We are likened to vessels as Christians. We bring glory. Hmm. We're going to see this in next week's study. Uh, we're created for the glory of the Lord, to bring him glory. Revelation chapter 4. For thy pleasure they are and were created. We bring him glory. Hmm. But look at verse 25. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the shore place be removed and be cut down and fall. This is interesting too. What did they do when they took Jesus down off the cross? They removed the nails. And what happened to the body of Jesus? Well, it was cut down and it fell. Down like that. And they buried him. And the burden that was upon it shall be cut off. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. 
Hmm. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> for the Lord hath spoken it. God didn't say, hey, I'm going to have a man say this and whatever. The Lord spoke a prophecy about the Messiah in the future. Eliakim didn't fulfill it. Jesus Christ did. And you can't know who is, has the key of the house of David until you go back here to the book of Revelation in chapter 3. Going back to Revelation chapter 3. How about that? But I've got some more stuff for you. It's very, very interesting things the Lord showed me through this study. Verse 8, Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast three things. Again, that number three. A little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Three. Hmm. Jesus opens and shuts doors for you to witness to the lost. Very important. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to show you the proof of this. He has the key. He can open and shut doors of opportunity to witness. Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> verses 6 and 7. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Have you ever had an experience where you really wanted to witness to somebody and you get yourself all psyched up for it and you're just like praying and just maybe even fasting and you're just like, I'm going to go, I'm going to try to give them this thing, I'm going to give them this tract, and, you know, and you're just like, Oh, please, Lord, please help me to be able to witness to him. Just, ah, oh, I, 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 I want to witness to this person. And you go there, and it's just like the conversation goes off in some other direction. And each time you try to draw it back to salvation, it just goes off again. And, and, you, and you end up leaving at the end, and you're just like, what on earth happened? The door wasn't open. I remember that there was a situation back when uh, I was part of a house church down in Pennsylvania where we were going around, we had this, you know, brilliant idea to wrap, you know, tracks like, you know, tri-fold tracks, eight and a half by 11s that are folded three times, you know, so they're tall and kind of narrow. And we had this brilliant idea to wrap them up like Christmas presents, red and green paper, you know, we put little shiny ribbons around them and everything else. And uh, we were going around to these big modern Babel buildings and they had tracks in them about the new versions and about rock music being of the devil and stuff like this and true salvation, how to come to the Lord, you know, uh, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, you know, we're going around to these big modern Babel buildings and we're like putting these track packs, our Christmas presents, <laughs> we're putting them underneath the windshield wipers. And uh, we went out to this one place, Lancaster County, Lancaster County Bible Church. And we went out the first time and it was like, snowing and the services were canceled we went out the next time you know we planned it again for like the next week or whatever went out again and it got freezing rain and they let the people out early started the freezing rain and it was just like every single time we went it was just something happening just no 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 finally we went back the third time we should have learned our lesson but we went back the third time and we're putting the things on and here comes this woman out you know they got like cctv cameras everywhere because big huge you know, their, their budget's like $7 million a year. It's huge. You could be like 100, 200 yards away from the thing and you can feel the, the base in your chest outside with no windows open. Wicked is the devil. But So I'm out there and I'm putting these tracks on vehicles and things and this, this security woman comes out. You know, she's dressed like a prostitute. You know, she comes out, what, excuse me, what are you doing? And I said, putting tracks on vehicles. <laughs> she goes, you're not allowed to do that and stuff. And I said, I don't see any signs saying I can't. And she's like, well, it's, you're not allowed to do that. You know, we're going to call the police. And I was like, call them. I said, go ahead. And she's like, uh, you know, we'll take them off the vehicles. I said, I'm not taking them off the vehicles. And she said, who, who, Ted, 
Who told you to do this? And I said, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I turned around and walked away from her. I wasn't about to take them off those vehicles. But, you know, we got back in the vehicle. And it's kind of funny because they were like, then they brought out other security people and they're taking them off and throwing them in the trash. It, you know, trash bags. And they're throwing our tracks in the trash. Whatever. They'll remember that when they hit eternity. But uh, it's kind of funny because they saw us doing it in one section, but another one of the brothers was over in another area, kind of a hidden area, you know, the one parking lot. And I don't think they saw him, but we'll see. <laughs> no, but uh, what was going on there? There wasn't an open door. So don't beat yourself up when you go and you try to witness to somebody and there's no open door. I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the doors of, of preaching and witnessing are closing in this country. People are doing things and being so wicked. And I'm not talking just America. I'm talking any country. Wherever you're at, a lot of the doors of preaching and gospel are closing. And the Lord's doing the closing. But you see, there's this, still this philosophy with so many of the brethren, this church-building philosophy of, of, get them in, get them in. we got to get them in. we got to be so winning souls. Are you winning any souls? Have you won souls? Did, did you win a soul this week? The Lord didn't open any doors. And you'll know, you'll know. There will be times when the Lord will open the door and you will check it out or you will keep your mouth shut or some other thing. You'll be in a conversation and somebody will say, I just don't know what to believe about eternity or, or God or anything else. That's an open door. You know, hey, I was at, man, I just don't know what's going on. I was at church this week and they're doing some weird, really weird stuff. I, I, I don't want to burden you with it. That's an open door. Speak. Somebody comes up to you and they say, Hello, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I'd like to talk to you about the Lord or about the Bible or something like this. Can we have a Bible study? <laughs> That's an open door. Talk to them. You know? But if somebody, you go up to somebody and, and you say, uh, could I, you know, and, and they're talking about all kinds of things, the weather and whatever else and stuff like this, and you say, yeah, well, you know, the, the Lord uh, is really giving us a good day. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 the Lord, yeah. Hey, it was really nice talking to you. It's good seeing you, you know, and they walk away. You didn't fail because you didn't win them to Christ, okay? There was not a door open. Understand that. Please don't beat yourself up. And when I say go out and, and witness to the lost and things like that, most of what we're doing right now as the body of Christ, true, you know, soul winning, um, most of it is gospel tracting, accountability tracting, I like to call it. Go out, put those gospel tracts out, put them in bathrooms, put them on park benches and things. You don't even have to be handing them to people. Why? Because we're just making people accountable. Judgment is coming very, very quickly to this country and to other countries as well. Your country that you're in, I'm sure. The whole world. So right now what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get those few remaining people out there saved. But most of the people that are going to get a gospel tract, they're going to take it, they're going to throw it right in the, gar in the garbage. I saw these little gospel coins one time uh, right there. I've shown these things in other studies. It has, uh, you know, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ on the back. They don't put our Lord in, but ran out of space, I guess. But I saw this little kid, and he saw one of these coins. It couldn't have been more than about eight, nine years old. And he took the thing, and he threw it down on the ground, and he picked it up, and he threw it down again. And I thought to myself, that kid's been through some serious mind control. No kid that's eight or nine years old is going to look at this and be offended at this. Atheist parents, I'm sure. What's going on? There's no open door. I didn't feel guilty about that kid throwing that coin out. Whatever. But let's continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 9. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be, it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. 
that I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Look at this, verse 9. For a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Part of you becoming a Bible-believing Christian is you're going to have to enjoy the thing of having adversaries. If you're so thin-skinned that you can't stand anybody talking negatively about you or to you, you're not going to do too good. In fact, I would say it's kind of like the uh, stony ground hearer that they hear the word, they receive it, but there's no root there. And when people start to persecute them, they fall away. They say, oh, I, oh you know. When the Lord will open doors for you to witness, it doesn't mean that it's just going to be like easy and smooth and everything's just going to go wonder. Everybody's just going to be like, tell me about Jesus too. I want to hear, you know, <laughs> you're going to get many adversaries, but a great door will be open to you many times. Yeah. Be always ready for that open door of opportunity. But let's continue. Turn your Bible to John chapter 9, or excuse me, John chapter 10, verse 9. What's the significance of this door? John chapter 10, verse 9. Just a little interesting thing here. It says, Jesus speaking, it says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Reference to us being caught up and coming back down again and finding the pasture, which is the millennial kingdom. Talked about that in other studies. Um, so I'm not going to get into it here. But Jesus Christ is the door. Interesting. And he has the key to David, or the key of David, the key to the millennial kingdom. There. Very interesting. And what does John see in Revelation chapter 4, which we'll be talking about next week? A door open in heaven. Looking forward to seeing that door. Definitely. But it's very interesting. It's almost like, you know, when we were out there in public, we are the body of Christ. And it's like we can walk up to people and the Lord says, kind of opens up the door. And the people see our Christ-likeness. And we can say, I'd like to introduce you to somebody. There's a door open. The door opens up. Can I tell you about my Savior? I, uh, you know, it, no, I don't, I don't want to hear about it. It's a, whew, the door goes shut. Okay. How many times, how many more times is that door going to open and shut before the Lord finally shuts that door and says, okay, time's up. That's up to the Lord to decide. It's not up to you to decide. And, uh, well, I can overpower them with my superior intellect and my extreme knowledge of the Bible and the scriptures, and I can... I can wow them into, you know, and convince them through science and evidence and all kinds of other things that they're of their need for salvation. Uh, you don't come to the Lord through science. You come to the Lord by being broken, by saying, I'm a sinner. God resisteth, resisteth the proud. Be very careful about that stuff. But let's go back to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. Great portion of Scripture, I'll tell you what. Very, very interesting. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8. Come on here. Look at the three things. Thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Hmm. Um... Did you know that there are three things required of you for you to be like the Lord? Thou hast a little strength. Kind of like Jesus when he was here on the earth. I mean, did he have a lowly birth? Yeah. Did he have lots of money? No. Was he very popular? No. <laughs> the Bible says he wasn't even attractive. Isaiah chapter 53. When we shall see him, there's no beauty in him that we should desire him. He wasn't even an attractive man. Probably a very homely looking guy walking around and stuff. This homeless Jew, not attractive, not educated, humble beginnings. He's born in a stable, you know. People say, what, you're born in a barn? Jesus was. He had a little strength. Do you have a little strength as a Christian? 
Oh, I'd be much more effective if I was a millionaire. I highly doubt it. Highly doubt it. Has kept my word. Who inspired the writing of Scripture? The Holy Spirit. Are we seeing another passage here on the Godhead? Little strength. Kept my word. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. What's the third one? Has not denied my name. Um, what is the commandment about not taking the name of God in vain? Let's see. It's uh, found in Exodus chapter 20. It would be the uh, third commandment. That's all just coincidence now, mind you. <laughs> I don't think so. Amazing, isn't it? Verse 9. Another verse kicking replacement theology. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Very interesting. Because again, you know, I do believe that it's, there's a lot of application there to a Christian today, but also a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, it's going to be kind of funny, all these replacement theology, heretics, rapture happens, they stay down, and, you know, and then it's like God starts to deal with the nation of Israel, and some of those replacement theology heretics might make it through the time of Jacob's trouble, and they get there to the end, and the Lord says, okay, to the Jews, you, you know, Jews that were there, and the Rothschild created Israel and all this stuff, come on in, millennial kingdom, you rotten replacement theology heretics, I'm going to cast you down into hell. Hmm, interesting. Verse 10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The word of my patience. Hmm, thought about that and I thought, isn't that interesting? Because this book took well over 1,500 years to write. Talk about a word of patience. I mean, you know, Come along and I say to you, uh, I'd like you to write a book for me. Oh, okay. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want it to be about? Well, I'm going to have you just uh, do the maybe a book or two here, and then I'm going to have a guy, you know, 100 years from now, you know, take up from where you left off, and then another 300 years after that, I'm going to have somebody else, and, and uh, you know, 600 years after that, I'll have this guy, and then, you know, a couple years after that, you know, that guy, and then eventually we'll finish it. And it all has to line up. It has to mesh together. Rightly divided, of course, but uh, it all meshes together. <laughs> How do you do something like that? You don't. Man can't write a book like this book. God can. You'd have to be outside of eternity to write a book that takes 1,500 years and has, what, 40 different authors or something like that, I think they say. What is it? The word of his patience. Are you keeping it? Well, the Bible says right there, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now you can make the hour of temptation the time of Jacob's trouble. You can say, well, we're going to be kept from that because we've kept the word of God. I understand. But again, we're looking at instruction in righteousness here. What's the instruction in righteousness? Instruction in righteousness is there are some really, really bad things that can happen to Christians. And I believe, and I can say I'm living proof of this, God can spare your life in many serious situations. I had a brother write to me recently about an accident that he was in, fell down backwards and hit his head on concrete and had a few scratches. Could have been killed and had a few scratches. And by the way, has no health insurance. Oh, what if something bad would happen? Something bad could have happened, but God protected him. Why? He believes the book. He lives by the book. He trusts the Lord. You keep the word of God's patience. You keep this book and you say, I'm going to hold fast what I know. I'm going to stand by this book. Nobody's going to take this King James Bible from me. You would be amazed at the kind of things God can deliver you from. There are many temptations that can happen to you as a Christian, and God can keep you from those. He'll keep you safe. And I'm convinced, you know, I've, I've looked into this thing of people and they're saved or versus lost or whatever, and, I, you know, it's, it's kind of like, ugh, after a while. 
because, you know, I want to teach people how to be saved and, and I want to make sure I'm doing it right. And, you know, there's people that I think in some ways they might have come to the Lord broken in a repentant state. But it's like, are they really putting their faith in the Lord? Because you look at them and they're just like, they don't trust the Lord. You know, well, I think I'm saved. I I, I might be saved. I, I hope I'm saved. And I, don't, I just, I have these issues. Well, give them over to the Lord. Well, I, yeah, but I don't know if he can really take care of this. And I'm going... Did you really come to the Lord in faith? Have you really put your faith in Him? I don't know. Look at verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Jesus comes quickly. Written, you know, back 90 AD or so. He didn't come quickly. What are you talking about? It's been almost 2,000 years since He went up to heaven and things like that. What are you come quickly. Well, if you read over in uh, 2 Peter, I don't have the, well, okay, I do have the, we're not going to go there, but 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, it talks about one day with the Lord is as, as, as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now, what would you say if I told you, I'm going to be coming to your house. I'm going to start, I'm going to do a, a trip, a tour of the world or something like this, and I'm going to be showing up at your house in a little bit less than two days. You say, what? Uh, huh? What? Yeah, I'm going to be knocking on your front door in less than two days. Would you be ready for me to come? Are you ready for Jesus Christ to come? He's only been up in heaven for not quite two days yet. Uh, I guess you could say he's coming quickly. Is your house in order? It's rough, isn't it? It's rough. Verses 12 and 13, Revelation chapter 3. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Very, very great promises heading our way. You know, amazing stuff that's coming in our future. But now let's look at the last of the seven churches. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Hmm. What's the story behind the church of Laodicea? Well, go in your Bible to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. They are actually mentioned in one of the Pauline epistles. Colossians chapter 4, beginning in verse 15. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea. And Nymphus and the church which is in his house. Hmm. House church. Imagine that. And when this epistle was read among you, calls that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Hmm. They're doing pretty good, apparently. At least they were. Turn back to Revelation chapter 3. You see, uh, unlike Sardis that we read about earlier at the beginning there, chapter 3, verse uh, 2. Where is it? Uh, wait, where is it? Yeah, 1, verse 1. Sorry, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Under the angel of the church in Sardis, they were living but basically dead spiritually. But the Laodiceans aren't like that. You see, they have a zeal for God but there's a lot of leaven mixed in with it. They're not hot, they're not cold, they're lukewarm. They compromise. They, well, I just, I don't think we should talk much about it. We shouldn't judge people's salvation. We, I, I can't say I'm for this kind of music. I can't say I'm against it. I just think that, you know, some things might be okay, but maybe others are, they're not hot or cold. Have you run into some Laodicean Christians out there? 
Yeah, let's read about this. Verse 15 and 16. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Hmm. Now that can go two ways. Again, the Lord can simply say, hey, you want to live like the world, you want to act like the world, and look like the world, be like the world, I'm just going to, you go ahead. Live like the world, die like the world. Might be saved, but you just, whatever. The other possibility is that there could be people within that system that are foreign matter within the body of Christ. When you spew something out of your mouth, you're not vomiting out a heart or a lung, I hope. <laughs> you're vomiting out food, foreign matter within the body. But let's continue here. Look at the look at these the sins of these people. Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. My son just got up and he sounds a little bit upset. Sorry about that if you're hearing the crying upstairs. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And this is talking to saved people too, by the way. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods. Very interesting. Because a lot of people in America, the UK, Germany, Australia, Canada, a lot of these countries, you think that you're rich. We all think, hey, we're, we're doing pretty good. We're pretty rich. Um, most of our wealth is debt-based. It's, it's not even real. It's artificial. Our currency is paper. That's not richness or, or riches, you know. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. <clears throat> but let's look at verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. See, the Lord's not against you being rich. He's against you being rich in worldly matters, in worldly affairs. He's saying, I want you to be rich, but in the right way. We're going to show you about that in just a minute here. Let's read the rest of the verse. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Oh, the joys of having a two-year-old. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer lost, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." All right, the judgment seat of Christ is what we're reading about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Gold is part of it. I have a whole study on that. I'm not going to get into all the scriptures on it, but gold is God's righteousness. What do we read earlier? Be holy for I am holy. See, that's there. You're supposed to have God's righteousness. All right, look at verse 19. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be what? Zealous. What does it mean to be zealous? Well, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, 
but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Works meet for repentance. That's what's going on there. True godly sorrow that works repentance to salvation, that will produce certain things in a people's life. And one of those things that's produced is being zealous. Okay? Witnessing. Being, being willing to just, just, I'm a Christian. You know, not hiding it. You're zealous for the truth. So when you have somebody in the Laodicean church period where they're saying, hey, you know, or in this time here where there's a lot of Laodicean type people out there, they're neither hot nor cold, what's the cure? Well, verse 19, as many as I love, if God loves you, he's going to rebuke and chasten you. He's going to say, hey, that thing that you're doing is wrong. What should you do about it? Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The Lord says to you, hey, those books right there, those are wrong. Get rid of those books. Well, Lord, no, no, there's no, well, Lord, go get those books, take them outside and burn them. That's called being zealous. The Lord says, hey, I don't want you working there. Hey, I don't want you doing that. Hey, I don't want you doing this. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Change your direction. That's the advice that the Lord gives us. It's very, very important. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Very interesting there. Um, let me ask you a question. What would you do if Jesus wanted to come to your house? I mean, what would you want to do when he's there? I guess it would be the way to say it. Well, let's look about that. John chapter 14 Verse 23. I mean, you know, we've all heard the challenging things of, you know, would you want the Lord to see certain things in your house and things like that? And that is definitely challenging. But uh, the real question is, what would you do when he comes to your house? Your house is clean and everything else and stuff like that. What are you going to do? John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him hmm interesting look at luke chapter 24 luke chapter 24 verse 33 And they arose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and they and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared, appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. <laughs> but they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Look at this, verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Hmm. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high, the day of Pentecost, which comes up. But isn't it interesting there, verse 45, he opens their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. 
Hmm. What did I say at the very beginning of this thing? This study? You're to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't wander out of the way of understanding and head up in, in some congregation of the dead. If Jesus Christ comes over to your house, you know what He wants to do? You say, hey, Lord, do you want to watch a movie? No. You want something to eat? Well, maybe, but then we want to do something else. Oh, what do you want to do, Lord? How about you get out your Bible? We'll have a Bible study. Is that what you want to do? That's what He wants. And it's a blessed thing. I can testify. I wanted to come out with this study much earlier, and it was just like, uh, you know, I just I, I can't get this stuff and everything else. And I prayed and I prayed. It took a couple days. It wasn't just like, Lord, help me to understand. Boom, it was there. No. no. It took a couple days. A couple times of me just sitting down and praying, just saying, Lord, I, please help me to get through this thing. I, I can't figure out some of these verses. He'll show you. The Lord will show you great things through His Word. And I've met people, you know, and they're, they're not even in full-time ministry. They're not preachers or whatever else. And they and they like, Lord showed me this in the, in the Bible. Is this right? And they tell me, and I'm like, wow, I never saw that before. That's amazing. Yeah. What happened? They invited God into their house, their body, you know, and they had some fellowship with the Lord. The Lord sat down and opened up the Scriptures to them. There is no greater feeling on earth than when the Lord gives you understanding of His Word. And the Lord shows you something, you're just like, oh. and that connection to God the Father. It's just like a, there's no adrenaline rush that can compare to it. And you see, atheists and unbelievers out there and things, they try to understand this book through their intellect. can't happen. It has to be through revelation. And you're not going to get the revelation of God until you're saved. Until you come in the right spirit and you say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Till your pride is broken, God's not going to show you one thing from this book. Except for the fact that you're a sinner. But let's uh, continue here. Back to Revelation chapter 3. We've got two more verses here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. Read Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 sometime when you're feeling down. In fact, let's do that right now. Sometimes I go to these verses, sometimes I don't, you know, depending on how the sermon's going or whatever, but this one's important. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You know, it's kind of like uh, you go out into the woods and, and um, you find some fruit and you pick the fruit and everything else and you have it just in your pockets and wherever else you can put it and everything and, and you're walking like, oh, man, i got to get this back to the car, but it's going to be like a mile walk or something. It's like oh, you're walking along and finally you start getting a little tired and you say, well, I guess I don't need all this fruit. And you kind of take some out and you throw it on the ground. Well, that feels a little bit better. And you go and you take a little bit more out. And long story short, you get back to the car, you left all the fruit back in the woods. Um, but now you're thirsty. Now you want some of that fruit. But it's all back there. It's kind of like what a lot of Christians are going to have. You were doing good. You were producing fruit as a Christian. But things started to get kind of hard. Things started to get kind of tiresome and wearying and oh, everybody's turned against me. I don't have any friends. I don't have anybody I can even talk to anymore. There's just like, and you just kind of get down and everything and you start to say, you know what? Some of this fruit's a little bit heavy. Let me just kind of put some of that stuff down. I don't want to have that anymore in my life. I, I, I don't, I'm getting a little bit tired of this persecution stuff and I'm getting a little bit tired of reading the Bible all the time. It's all I ever do. I just kind of could just watch a movie now and then, you know, from Hollywood. And you know, if I could just watch some television, I mean, just something that, you know, what's happening? You're fainting. You keep on with the work that you're doing. You hold on to that fruit and you get more. As you're walking out of the woods of this life, the wilderness of this world, seek to fill your pockets up more. 
don't leave fruit behind. Get more fruit. You know, it used to be when I was a boy, you know, we'd we'd go and we'd pick these cherries and stuff, and you'd you'd pick your your shirt up like this, you know, you'd pull it out, and so it'd make a, you know, an impression like that, and you'd be picking fruit and sticking it in your cherries. And then I get in trouble because I had cherry black cherry stains all over my you know T-shirt, but uh, it's okay because we had lots of cherries. You know? <laughs> And, and, you know, you, you don't, don't have any more room in your pockets and you can't carry any more. You know, you put a bunch in your mouth, of course. That's a good way to carry them. But, to, you know, put some in your shirt and you're going, okay, what else can I get? You know, carry some more fruit back. The Lord's going to open up plenty of doors in the time that we have left and be ready for those times. Be ready to show Jesus Christ to the lost world so that you can have fruit that you can take with you when you go up to heaven. And when the Lord comes and He says, uh, Are you busy? You say, For you, Lord, I'm never busy. Never too busy. Come on, sit down. Hey, Lord, I have a question. What does this verse mean here? And what does that verse mean there? Things. Verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And uh, that's when God's done dealing with the churches. At least if you're talking about church age type churches. Because in Revelation chapter 4, we go up. But that's not going to be for this week. That'll be for next week. So uh, just a really, really amazing chapter. Uh, really enjoyed the study of that one. And um, like I said, some of these studies are going to take me a little bit longer than a week to do. Um, and uh, they'll come out when they come out. I'm not going to do this thing quickly and just rush through it and whatever else. Um, no. There's other studies I'm going to be bringing out too throughout this thing. It might take me a couple months to get the whole way through Revelation, but uh, this stuff takes time. So uh, that is going to be it. Um, please keep us in your prayers. The things I was mentioning earlier, um, just a lot of, you know, one of the things uh, many people know this, some of you don't. Um, we believe in living debt free, and which means we don't have very nice things. Uh, when you get into debt, it's you know you go out, you get what you want basically, and you say, "I want that house, I want this, you know, whatever else." Uh, when you live debt free, you go out and you say, "What can I afford?" <laughs> you know, and it's it's a great way to live. It's very uh, a lot of freedom, um, but it keeps you very busy because you know this place that we bought has a lot of problems. It has a lot of issues. Um, other things too and, and things like that um, and uh, I wrote down the other day a list of my to-do list of things that I need to get done a lot of these jobs might take a week or two you know whatever some of them are easier I can get them done in an hour or so but my list when I got done writing down everything I needed to get done a lot of it before it gets too cold here which it's already getting kind of cold we've already had a little bit of snow the other day uh, a couple days ago um, it was just like a little bit of sleet, not a whole lot, but it's getting cold. And, um, but I had 71 things. Now, I've gotten about two or three things done, so I'm down in the 60s now, so I'm, I'm doing pretty good. But <laughs> a lot of stuff to do. And uh, one of the things that I'd like people to pray about is um, I mentioned that our, we had an older station wagon and that thing was dying, so we sold it. And I said we got an older uh, Jeep Wagoneer, it was called, and... and uh, you know, wanted to get older vehicles. I like older vehicles. I can work on them easier. Um, not really into the whole modern technology thing with vehicles. They're harder to work on, in my opinion, in many ways. But I bought the thing on Craigslist, and uh, I was told that uh, it's not got very many rust problems. It runs great. It's this, it's that. And you know, I was like, you know, I'm going to be driving this thing as a regular vehicle, not just as a classic show vehicle or whatever. Oh, yeah, 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 and there's no problem and everything else. Um, I bought it. It was down in Massachusetts. We're way up in northern Maine. There's no way for me to go see it, so I bought it sight unseen. The guy was seemed like a very reputable guy. Uh, we were ripped off, unfortunately. Um, it's got a hole about that big in the back floor, right behind the driver's seat, um, right at the base of the back seat, you know, the only thing covering it is carpet. <laughs> you lift the carpet up, you can see the ground. Um, driving it down to the one garage, you know, to see if they could fix the hole and things like this, and 
coming back and the window goes, the driver's side window goes down into the door. And I'm like, okay. So, you know, I'm like doing the, it has the old wind up windows and I'm like, okay, it's not on the track. Great. So I'm like, you know, grab the glass and I'm pulling the window up and sliding it back up in place. And I'm like trying to half, you know, keep my arm against it as I'm driving along. <laughs> nice. And uh, looking at the temperature gauge, the temperature gauge climbing, 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 climbing. I'm starting to smell the motor getting hot. I'm going, oh boy, get into the parking lot, go to make a hard turn. Something in the back end is going, ur, ur, ur. you know, you can feel like a grinding noise. And I'm thinking, oh great, is something went wrong with the four wheel drive system? It's got quadra track. The old Jeeps had that. And I'm just like going, oh man. So we got a bad situation right now with the vehicle thing. Uh, we're praying about trying to sell it. We're going to lose money, but uh, it's going to cost us a lot to fix it probably. And it's just like, uh, you know, so that's been distracting me. And I've been trying to think at what to do about this. And, you know, I bought it as is. I can't, there's no recourse. I can't go back and say, hey, you, you promised. There's nothing I can do. I bought it as is. Um, so, uh, please pray for us. I mean, it's all, all we have right now for a vehicle is my old Ford truck, which is not meant for daily driving. It's a big truck, has a huge motor in it, and it's very bad on gas. And, uh, it, it's a reliable, um, very, very good truck, but we bought it just for hauling heavy things around and stuff like that, you know? Uh, so it's, it's very expensive to drive it, and I don't like driving that thing much, especially now with winter coming, and they're going to be putting salt on the roads, which would destroy my old truck. So uh, we're praying about it. Um, <laughs> always something. But uh, just uh, wanted to, to just say that just as a matter of uh, please pray for us. I'm still working on getting things switched around here. Going to be taking this all the shelving and all the books down and moving them and things and rebuilding and all this other stuff. Another thing came up recently. We had to get another computer. Um, my wife's computer is basically shot. Uh, it was an old one that I had. It's many, many, many years old. Thankfully, my professional computer is still doing very well, but uh, we had to get another computer uh, for her, for her research and things. She does a huge amount of research for the ministry, so it's not like, well, you didn't really need one. We had to do one, uh, you know, get a computer and she doesn't do video editing or rendering so you know it doesn't have to be quite the level of my professional computer but still you know we needed to get something decent for her so uh, just that's why part of the reason why the study was kind of late you know as well so uh, but I really would appreciate your prayers um, we go through a lot of spiritual attacks as I've always said it's up and down and up and down and, and uh, we deal with people and things a lot of different people so, I um, believe that's going to be it. Um, so, I guess we'll close with a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for the great challenges from your word. I thank you, Lord, for this great uh, book, this great uh, word of your patience, Lord, that you waited for over 1,500 years to write a book, Lord, and it all just meshes together and lines up. And, and just, it's such an amazing book. And um, we have such precious promises from this King James Bible. And I just pray, Lord, that everybody out there would hold fast to it, that they would watch out for false prophets that try to take it from them, that they would watch out for false prophets bringing false doctrine, and that uh, they would all stand by their convictions and not worry about what people think about them. And I just pray, Lord, that you would give us open doors of opportunity to witness for Thee and help us to know, Lord, when You've opened a door and help us to know when You've shut a door and not feel guilty about not having a chance to witness to somebody when in fact it's you that shut the door on that person. Give us discernment, Lord, for these uh, very strange times that we're living in. And I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support of this ministry. Uh, thank you for your prayers. That's the most important thing. We need prayer. So... That is going to be it. Like I said, I'm not sure if it's going to be next week or a week after or whatever. I'm going to be, there's a couple other sermons I need to get done, questions people have had, sermons I need to preach. So Revelation chapter 4 is another very interesting chapter. Um, so we will see you in the next Revelation expository study for Bible-believing Christians. 
Thank you for watching.